Buenos días. Eh. Good morning to everyone present here today that have come to this event organized by Fundación Telefónica in this space that we care so much for. Um, Mrs. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, thank you for being here with us. It is an incredible opportunity for all of us. Eh, hoy, eh, Today, with together with uh, Women in a Legal World and together with the Club de Madrid, we are introducing this event that is within a very important week for us, uh, where we have the International Day of Women, where we are holding many activities to bring women who are role models from all fields, who are an inspiration for us, and who are an example to follow by all the girls and all the young girls um, to show that women are holding very important positions in society. We have uh, uh, had with us uh, thinkers, scientific, scientists and leaders from around the world who have wanted to be here with us and share their knowledge and their experience with us uh, and to become uh, women who are showing the great potential of women in all segments of society. In the Fundación, we do not only work uh, for the rights and the value of women during this week, but throughout the whole year. On the one hand, we boost, we try to promote the role of uh, women and giving visibility to these women who are leaders around the world in our, our publications and all the fields and areas in which we work. And we also promote education uh, of girls, employability of women, and especially in those sectors where they're less uh, present. We live in a digital society where training and education and digital skills is crucial in order to be uh, able actors in a society that is experiencing uh, very fast changes and since that since the pandemic has moved, uh, has taken a lot of steps forward in terms of digitization. So we are helping training these girls and these young girls to give them a future of possibilities and potential and to enable a just and fair world for women and men. If we do not help uh, women develop themselves, it's very difficult to reach equality in the whole of society. So this is why it is a great honor to have here Ellen Johnson Sirleaf here with us today, ex-president of Liberia, uh, Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Nobel Prize in, 12, in 2011. She is a wonderful woman. She was the first uh, chief of state that was democratically elected in the African continent. She has been acknowledged for her defense of peace and democracy and empowering women and the defense of the rights of women. She, her life is doubtlessly an example to us all. She is an, uh, a must as a voice that represents all the values that we are uh, trying to sustain within the context that we are going through today, such as solidarity, peace, uh, reconciliation, uh, the rejection of violence, and the importance of education and training for everyone to build a better world. So I don't want to uh, take any more time of this event uh, so that you can listen to such a special person that we are having here with us today in Fundación Telefónica. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to her. Pues vamos a comenzar. Let's start. Thank you very much, uh, Carmen, for your words. I'm, my name is Montserrat Dominguez. I am a journalist, and it's really an incredible opportunity to have a real influencer, a, a woman who has had an influence as an economist, as a politician, as a president, as a peace uh, Nobel Prize, and also as a permanent activist, who, which she still is, working for the rights of women and human rights in general, and to have her here to share her experience and her vision, her view of the world at the very difficult times that we are living in. We have been fighting for two years against a pandemic that we still have not been able to um, to defeat and that is still causing uh, havoc, particularly in Africa and also in countries around ours. 
and at this time when we have just recovered this war la language uh, having the the forefront fighters and and fighting against the pandemic and the covid we have to move a step forward towards using this war language with this invasion of Russia. And there's an image that I would like to ask uh, President Solif about because we see the refugees coming out massively from Ukraine. And this is something that in Liberia, in, in your country, uh, President Solif, you had the uh, uh, opportunity of living, of seeing first hand and as a president you had to work very actively in order to rebuild the country what comes to your mind when you see these pictures of the trains coming out of ukraine and uh, trying to find refuge in uh, the borders of europe those women those children leaving men behind who stay to fight what are the feelings what are the memories that this type of images bring to mind I'm extremely saddened when I see the destruction, the devastation, the many women and children that are dying and subject to such sufferings because of the war that's ongoing. Liberia faced similar circumstances. Our population was subjected to two decades of civil war. And today, 30 years over, we have not fully recovered. Millions of our people fled the country into exile in the displaced population within and outside the country. And I think we have yet to be able to build, rebuild the destruction that we face, the physical destruction, but more importantly, the mental destruction, the trauma that our young people have faced the many young ones who were child soldiers and who were just innocent victims who did not have the opportunity to go to war, I mean to go to school because of the war. Today we have a generation that still is unable to cope with the requirements of a modern age. And so as I see what's happening to the people of Ukraine, like I say, we get so saddened and we wonder what will it take for the powers of the world to see this destruction and to act jointly to bring these sufferings to an end. What can we do? We have no power. What we do have are voices. And we can only voice collectively as much as possible our concern for those who are going through these difficult times, those who are subjected to death and, and destroyed livelihoods. So I'm sorry. And um, you said, I mean, uh, President, you had the chance to live in your country that women are usually the first victims and the ones who endure in the longest run the consequences of a war, not only because most of violence is exerted against women. Yesterday we saw a hospital um, for mothers and children that had been bombed because, and also because women are in charge of rebuilding this civil society that needs to bring hope, that needs to recover the country. Sometimes women are not the protagonists in the first line in the war, but are the ones who endure the consequences and they have to carry the burden of the reconstruction. 
There's no doubt about that. First of all, women indeed are the victims, are the main victims, women and children, the main victims of war and conflict. And that's because they don't have any power to resist. A man in the society go off to war, children are left, homes are left, and it's the women who have to be the protectors of all. But at the same time, even though women are the victims, they are the ones who stand up. They are the ones who are able to promote peace and reconciliation. They are the ones who call and challenge the destruction of war and what happens to children. We have yet to, to see women giving this right in a more formal and official manner so that peacekeeping missions can put women at the forefront. That dialogue on peace and reconciliation will see more women at the table. Uh, those are uh, some of the actions that we must continue to promote, we must continue to stand up for them. Um, it's a good thing that women are so strong that although being victimized, they are the first ones with the courage to stand up in times of war. That's the experience of my country mm -hmm. when they were challenging a warlord that they were the ones that met every day, first for prayers, to pray for God's, God's help to give them the strength and the courage to do what they were doing. But they faced what might have been great recriminations and great, you know, response to them. They could have been hurt, they could have been killed. But they did stand up and take the action and so whether in the United Nations, whether in our own individual countries, um, we must do more, not only for the protection of women, uh, but to recognize the rights and the courage and the role of women so that they are the ones that are out there and take um, equal roles in trying to uh, protect society in my country. Uh, we still face as a result of um, the mindset and the attitude that comes from two decades of war, mm -hmm. where women are domestic violence becomes so easy and we don't have the legal systems uh, with, with the independence that those systems need uh, to be able to, to um, punish perpetrators of domestic violence. Uh, we have rape, again, some of the consequences of war. Rape of young girls. And so the effort for the rights of women is something we must always keep forefront in our minds, in our action. And collective action on the part of um, institutions like the Club de Madrid, mm -hmm. Um, the, um, the women in legal rights who, who are really part of hosting this event and what they do to bring to the conscience of the world that is necessary to have the constitution, the laws, and the policies state clearly the rights of women and the role of women so that it can be something, so that it can be a it can be respected, it can be implemented, it can be seen for the value that it brings to the life of humanity. Uh, it's, um, it's a big challenge, uh, whatever country we're in, uh, because the, the stereotyping, the obstacles that women face is global with different variations depending yep. upon the progress achieved in one country to the other. But it's global. And so the action must be global, it must be collective. And it must be a networking across borders because our, our rights are the same, our common, our goals are common. 
And so I'm glad to be a part of uh, whatever Club de Madrid and others are doing, to be as a member, uh, and as being here, to be able to exchange with you and with others. Uh, that's part of the kind of global collective actions that we seek and that we must all commit ourselves to because that's how women will get the rights they deserve. Mm. As a member of Club de Madrid, as an awardee of Women in a Legal World, how important is it to be to have uh, women who are lawyers, uh, women who have uh, influence in politics, economists such as you that are directly involved in politics. Uh, uh, President, I always ask myself, um, how was it to enter uh, political life in uh, Liberia? You were very young, you were 32. Which were your references? How did you build uh, your uh, capacity to influence, uh, to be in power, that then led you to uh, holding the presidency? Uh, these changes, and I remind you, we've never had a female president here in Spain. Uh, we will see. Uh, these changes um, are very slow until we have a woman in power who works in favor of uh, equality and he starts making a difference. Which were your references when you entered in politics in uh, Liberia, when you were a young economist who wanted to change the world? Well, I think the my journey uh, in leadership perhaps started um, from my family circumstance. Uh, my mother never made any difference between her two daughters and her two sons. So as a result, why my sister chose one road, I chose a rough road of playing football, climbing trees, uh, doing all those things that girls should not do. <laughs> Uh, and so perhaps that, that developed a different kind of consciousness in me. Uh, but also Liberia being a small country, today still not more than five, five uh, million people. Uh, we, we had very strong women who were able to take positions, whether it was the, in the form of our parliament chief in our traditional society, mm -hmm who stood up, who's the one that led the dialogue for peace, um, whether it's uh, the first, the second and first woman president of the United Nations General Assembly was a Liberian woman, Angie Brooks Randall, you know, and a woman judge who in the times of we were having turmoil in our streets, who walked the streets in her robes. Um, Emma, some, Emma Walker, Walsall. She walked the streets in her robe to stand up with young progressives who were challenging the wrongs in the country. Uh, and then if you move from there, you know, women who I saw, like uh, Winnie Mandela, Angela Davis, you know, all those women represented to me uh, models, role models. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think that enabled me to be quite an activist uh, in the country growing up, uh, being able to take positions, being able to speak openly against the ranks in society and the rights of women. Um, I, you know, I paid the price. Uh, I suffered the consequences because I had to go into exile many times. I was jailed three times in my country uh, for being able to, uh, to challenge. Um, but as a result, I think it also gave me, uh, first of all, an understanding of the victimization of women. Uh, uh, the, uh, the empathy for those who have to suffer, perhaps I felt a little bit stronger uh, in my role. Uh, the courage uh, to, to stand up, but also the recognition that one person can't do it alone. I can't claim that whatever 
I was able to do that. I did it on the basis of my own strength and my own ability. I did it because there were others who shared the same values I shared mm -hmm. and others who were willing to be a part of a collective action and others who, the ones before me on whose uh, shoulders I could stand yeah, to be able to take position. And so I think that perhaps has been a major propellant uh, that uh, led me into the leadership I rolled and, and I was grateful to women. I would not have been made president if, the, if thousands and thousands of Liberian women had not taken the decision that they felt men, leadership, men power had failed them over the years and had led to all the wars and conflicts and the devastation and destruction and that they wanted a change in a woman to see if that would bring change. Um, we did not achieve everything we wanted to in my presidency. Uh, we faced some of the same obstacles that still exist till today. Uh, but within that ability of the time we had, uh, we were able to, to hold peace in the country for 15 years. We, I had 12 years of presidency and the three years working in the interim government, we held the peace. And we were able to ensure that we laid the foundation uh, for economic growth and development. And so, and, that, uh, and so today I'm part of an international effort in so many things I do and so many ways where I work with other women and our, our part of our goal now is to bring men into the tent. <laughs> 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 because we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it unless men see the importance of the value of women. The contribution that women will make go beyond the home, you know, of taking care of the home, the children. And we do that. And we yeah. do that with honor. And we do that with commitment. And we know we have to do that. It makes us work harder than others, <laughs> harder than men. Uh, but we, we do need the men to recognize women's contribution. And we think that uh, there's empirical ev evidence of the increase to the world economy, <laughs> to GDP, when women's rights and participation are recognized and are employed in every area of national endeavor. Let me ask you, um, Spain is very close to Africa. We receive an important part of migrants who, uh, people who are looking for a new life in uh, Spain or the European Union, and sometimes we lose sight of the immense power, economical, uh, social, that the African continent is going through, and um, specific countries too, and the force, the strength of all these young people who have had access to an education, who are fighting for social structures that are more fair, more uh, equitable uh, in the different countries. Can you talk to us about Liberia? What's the situation of women? What is the power structure? What are the um, social forces? Uh, Africa and Liberia um, that are changing radically thanks to the participation of women in politics, economics, in, in the society. It finds itself virtually in the same situation. I cannot say that because I was a woman president for 12 years that I was able to change the structure uh, in any dramatic way. So today, our membership in the, in the uh, parliament Mm. Um, is still, is still, you know, 13 percent, very low, uh, which can, which is quite a lot. Like much of West Africa, we haven't have the, we haven't been able to do what um, other countries like Rwanda, South Africa, Senegal have been able to achieve in terms of women participation. 
Um, we've done much better in the executive area, first mm -hmm. with me, and that has continued um, in the, the government of today, in which uh, women are recognized in holding executive position. But when it comes to um, uh, the rights of women and justice for women, uh, we still suffer like so many other uh, countries, African countries, and not only African countries, but you know, world countries. And so we have not been able to, to get our judges and our legal systems and our constitutional system to implement the kinds of reform that are necessary to, to ensure the implementation of policy rights. We may have the policies, but unless they're made legal, yeah. unless in some cases they're made constitutional, so there's no violation of them, then you don't get the proper implementation of the policies. And so they just remain something on the books uh, that does not have the effect of being able to make the kind of change and reform that is envisioned. And this is where we need the totality of a population, the totality of leadership to all work toward those common goals. Uh, the same thing applies, I think, in, in most of the other African countries. Mm. We, have a traditional, we have traditional societies uh, in our countries. In some cases, they are marginal, marginalized. Certain, you know, ethnicity becomes a problem. Certain groups in the country uh, may, may be marginalized, may not be allowed um, the kinds of um, equality, the kinds of rights and privileges that others are allowed. Uh, Liberia was, was founded on the basis of free slaves. And that created a chasm in our whole society, the indigenous population on one side, uh, the slave, um, I mean, the returnees on another side. It took a long time for us to bring them together. It took a lot of effort for education, for people to see themselves as one. It took a lot of intermarriages. It took a lot of extended family systems uh, to try to bring this together. And so now today, I think uh, we are one nation, yes. Uh, but some of those old habits and old methods uh, are still there. So we have to continue to make more effort to ensure that this unity is consolidated, that it's long lasting, but that it's also protected under constitution and laws. And then women find, a, find another group of the marginalized. Um, and because women have faced all these obstacles over the years. And so, um, I, I, even though I, I you know, <laughs> as, as, as a woman president, the first, the first one democratic elected in Africa, everyone expected that I would have been able to, I wanted to have a women cabinet. I mean, I was being, uh, I was being ambitious. <laughs> because I could not achieve it. Mm. I could not achieve it because we did not have sufficient women that had reached that level of technical knowledge and skills to be able to, to manage a modern state. And so we, we just settled on strategic positions to make sure that we send the message that women don't have to always be the ones who are minister of gender you know, uh, uh, Minister of Health, mm. those things that, that have uh, much more concern and action for. So we, we, we made sure uh, a woman was a uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Commerce. You know, there were one, one but uh, and today we're, we're so, you know, of those women who were able to work with me and to work with other women and to work with men, of course. Mm. Uh, to bring over the change and, and thing. But then Liberia, you know, also faced Ebola. Of course. And that, of course, <coughs> changed everything. I mean, all the progress we had made in terms of GDP and other things. Uh, citizens left the country, businesses closed and whatnot. And it took us two years to recover. Uh, and today we still still uh, are fighting that and you know having now reached a place then now we face COVID-19 like everybody mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the the processes of of reconstruction <coughs> you know of, of uh, reinventing and re something in the country is still a process so quería quería preguntarle aparte de hacer una reflexión apart from 
making a reflection, I wanted to ask you, those laws that allow equality and permit equality, one thing is to have them and another different thing is to implement them. We share this with you. We have many laws that boost equality, uh, equal pay for women, and we know about this in Europe, uh, in Spain, and also in Africa. It is very difficult to uh, implement this uh, legislation. You mentioned Ebola, um, Liberia suffered uh, this epidemic. Were you able to prepare a little bit better in the face of COVID-19? Because for um, other countries, it was a big surprise. Some voices had alerted um, on the potential consequences of a global pandemic, but we just had to figure things out as uh, it happened. Right now, we're just celebrating the second anniversary, the first uh, moments of uncertainty, the spread of the virus, and even if we have vaccines in Europe, uh, much more in Europe than in Africa with a larger population, we still have a significant amount of cases in hospitals. In which way did uh, COVID-19 impact Liberia? And uh, taking into account your experience uh, with Ebola, did this allow you to be more alert, more prepared? Um, before I get into that answer, let me look at the audience a little bit and ask. Because you have your mask on, so I can see your face, to see your reaction, to see whether you smile, whether you laugh, whether you frown. So I have to ask you, is the interpretation okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think Here. I lost one of my Here. stuff. It's lost. Lost in translation. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Okay, I did get some laughs and some reactions. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> now I'm seeing a lot of uh, audience reaction. And that's always important for somebody who sits with somebody who's as smart as this moderator here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, COVID-19. Clearly, uh, devastation for the world because nobody expected it and expected it to be as severe as it has proven to be because when it started and the scientists mentioned it I don't think many of the countries the bigger countries really believed it and so they denied it until it started to spread rapidly. As a result, they were not prepared for it. Uh, and that lack of preparation uh, is evidenced by how long it has taken to be able to have the supplies, whether it's the PPEs, uh, you know. Yep. The scientists were good. They were able to develop a vaccination in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and that has started. Uh, we didn't face that in Ebola. Fasting wasn't delivered until now. Yeah. Um, so, and the spread has been so rapid, and now getting into di different variants uh, that has made it so difficult to cope. Africa perhaps was a little bit better off because of the experience of Ebola, even though. Ebola uh, took place only in three of the uh, West, a West African countries. But because of the solidarity among the African Union, others came from other places. The communication across borders enabled us to realize, and I think at one point, because of the nature of our society and the fact that um, our culture it's all vested in communities in something. We were able to, first of all, in the case of Liberia, move from a militant approach in the beginning to a community leadership initiative. And that is what has proven 
uh, to be the effective way to battle Ebola then and to be able to use the same approach to battle COVID-19 today. But of course, vaccination became the most effective immediate response to COVID-19. And that started another uh, drifting of global solidarity because obviously richer nations had the power, the money to buy vaccines from manufacturing companies in the West with none in the poorer countries or in, or in the South as we call it. And so, of course, human nature, they want all the Western richer countries wanted to ensure that 100% of their population was vaccinated first. And the vaccines were not enough with enough surplus to supply all the other countries. And so vaccine inequity became an issue and is still an issue today as to how we, how, uh, we ensure that um, effort by Africa and some of the um, uh, people from our corporate sector that put up the money, they also worked with, um, with partnership countries. European Union, the United States to develop uh, the platform, uh, COVAX, if many have heard of COVAX, yeah, of to get supplies uh, to the countries. Uh, there was the Act 1 that put the funding together to be able to, to get those. But um, the, vast, the manufacturing companies held on to this and there was no waiver of trips. You know, there was no manufacturing in, Af in, in not only Africa, in any countries of the South. I think uh, India and South Africa started a major effort to ensure that uh, we begin to get manufacturing there. Um, the World Trade Organization, headed by a strong African woman, mm -hmm. um, began to move toward the negotiations to make sure that manufacturing companies, and today, They've already agreed on the establishment of uh, five hubs mm -hmm. within Africa where they're going to produce the vaccine. But it's still going to be difficult because it, there are infrastructure issues, there are supply chain issues to be able to, at a time when COVID-19, which means that uh, most of the uh, basic goods are harder to move because everyone's, uh, everyone's on lock-in to, to stop it. So the difficulty of moving the goods fast enough to get into places and then where you have uh, distribution systems um, difficulties because of infrastructure constraints, to be, even if the supply were there, to be able to get it to some of the most remote areas in poor countries where there are no roads or railroads or things like that makes it very difficult. So the inequities are difficult to solve, not mm. only because of, the, of the, the lack of solidarity and the lack of humanity on the part of, of, of some countries, but also because of the reality of the situation in the countries that are, that are facing this. Mm. But there has been progress. Um, we now have the hubs. Manufacturing is going on. Many countries in um, the European Union, in the United States, have donated vaccines, you know, millions and millions of doses. We still hope that we can get the 70% of uh, people in the uh, uh, poor and middle income countries vaccinated by the middle of 2022. I'm not sure we'll be able to achieve you know, that uh, goal, but effort is being made to do it. Um, and then in the midst of all of this, we face a whole new world. Yeah. A, a, a world that uh, we all see so much uncertainties now, not only because of the war in Ukraine, but because we've had a decade of um, the challenges to democracy. Uh, a shifting from global interaction, global cooperation to nationalism, protectionism, you know, exclusion, 
Uh, this has also affected Africa because we had come a long way in our journey um, from military rule and coup d'etats to the promotion of democracy. In the last three years, we've had four of our countries yeah. reverse, you know, and, and we've had coup d'etats again, which is something that the African Union and all our member states are trying to combat and trying to see how do we ensure that the, the peaceful and regular transfer of power mm -hmm. as required by democracy is prevailed. And so they're fighting to, to see it. And with all the uncertainties of what's going on in the United States, you know, um, what has happened there, uh, what we're glad about, we're glad about Europe. Mm. I think the European countries have shown more, more solidarity, uh, more global interaction, you know, and strong partnerships with Africa either to to address COVID-19 or to address uh, general development uh, progress as has been over the years. And we, because of the strong relationship between Europe and Africa, I mean, Africa's own origins, so to speak, I mean, Africa's own societies have had a long historical relationship with Europe. Let me ask you, I'm gonna do the question in English since we, we're having <laughs> troubles with that and that, I hope that's, that's okay. Um, let me ask you about this race of nationalism uh, that is um, lighting the fire or of uh, no trust in um, uh, organizations such the United Nations or uh, which whom you have contributed or the World Bank. This this growing of um, of untrust uh, of of all these supranation uh, institutions that help put countries together and deal together, it, it could be vaccines, it could be cooperation, it could be economic development. This is a dangerous space, you know, because when you are only worried about your country, about about your citizens, uh, about your citizens with with a passport, and that's all, not the ones who come from from outside, you you get into a very um, difficult area where cooperation and collaboration between countries, with movements and activists, they are no longer as important as what your problem as a nation or as a country um, is. It, it gets difficult to get cooperation between countries if you start cutting the trust of the, uh, of the people in these institutions. It is concerning. Uh, it's been evolving over the past decade. Uh, in a way, many countries have just determined that uh, they need to do more self-protection the geopolitical rivalry, you know, uh, in a way have returned. And it, it spreads from the bigger powers, you know, to the smaller countries. Uh, and how do we address it, I think is, you know, it's an issue that all countries have to deal with, all leaders have to deal with. How do you ensure that multilateralism, which has propelled the progress of the world to date, which has ensured that not too many, not countries don't get left behind, you know. How do we ensure that it doesn't slip away as it seems to, to have been slowly you know, drifting. Uh, political systems uh, are changing by countries that feel that uh, autocracy and authoritarianism produces better results, you know. Uh, and that has affected global commitment to democracy and, and to 
to, to if I may put it this way, to people's power. Um, and the, the issue about people's power. Again, with the rise of uh, activism and robust challenges to authority, that's part of what education is doing also. Communication breakthroughs, the demonstration effect from television and radio and the fact that young people educated and wanting to make sure that they that their time has come that it's time for them to have power too mm. that they must have a role in society they must participate and so the activism is challenging stable autocracies <laughs> and that is bringing a, another reaction that says you know no 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 you know we have to control this. If we don't control it, you know, the, the, the state system, the political system at it says today will collapse. Yeah. Uh, so these are changing times for, affect all of us, it affects all of us, um, but we are also part of the response to it. Mm. Um, individually in our own thinking and in our own interactions in our own groupings and organizations and institutions and uh, what we are we are part of it and also part of it in the different ways in which we work together uh, to be able to uh, I mean we have foundations we have institutions that are working the United Nations uh, through its various agencies, uh, working to, through humanitarian system to address those issues where vic victims, you know, are, are suffering, whether from war or, or from general poverty, uh, finding the world global action that we had. You know, we've had the Millennium, uh, 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 Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. We shifted to Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we're now moving toward the common agenda, um, which is the most recent one. Are we going to be able to bring people together for a common agenda for the world, for a, a new thinking? That's the challenge for all of us. Oh, I have no answers. <laughs> I, I, I'm a part of those that question it, try in some way to be a part of those that respond to it. Um, but it's a concern that I guess it must start with each of us, with each of our hearts, with each of our minds, with each of our commitment to a better world through better participation, better unity, better cooperation. President Sadiq, I'm going to ask, uh, I know some people from the audience want to uh, pose you some questions, but just one last question. You, you've said, from my part, um, you said that once the glass ceiling is broken, there's no way to rebuild it. Um, but in your experience, what you have been grounded during the COVID-19, which you haven't been able to travel and to develop your um, uh, your action as an activist um, directly during the two years, although thanks to the technology we can connect now with uh, so many points of, of the world. Um, are you worried or concerned about any backlash against the women's rights and the women's ability to, um, to grow inequality in the, in the world, according to all the young activists who look at you and see such an inspiration? Um, do we have to be aware of the backlash could come uh, for the rights of the women? Well, we were facing some back backlash already, you know. Uh, in my country, because I was a woman president, the reaction of many men in our parliament was, if you've got a woman president, you've got enough. Why do you want more? <laughs> the experiment is over. <laughs> uh, but we also have you know, backlash from more traditional, you know, society, uh, more conservative society that believe a woman's place is in the home. 
uh, you know, uh, certain religious groups feel differently about the role of women and they will not accept uh, equal rights fully. So, and some backlash is, you know, uh, women are, how media treats women who are running for public office is different from how they treat men. You know, how people react to women that are trying to be activists is always, no, that's not a woman's role, a woman should be quiet demeaning, you know, and something, and that, that's the backlash of seeing women are getting too active, you know, women want to, to have ever too much rights, women want to take over the world, uh, women want to replace men too fast, give it time, and so in places, and sometimes this also has effect on women, because women sometimes uh, don't want these conflicts, you know. So they're sometimes restrained. They had they don't have the financial clout that men have uh, to move some of their own policies and programs and and institutions. Um, so, but, but the rights of women, the role and participation of women. Women leadership is on an irreversible track. It may, it's not moving at the pace that we want to see it, to achieve it in the time that it should. But it cannot be stopped because women are humans, are persons like any other. The same rights, the same education, the same qualities, the same courage, the same abilities, the same desires and ambition. And what we at our age do not achieve, our daughters, your, your daughters will achieve it. <laughs> you can't stop it. Thank you. Es realmente inspirado el escucho. It is really inspiring to hear you say this. Uh, do we have anyone among the public who would like to pose a question? We have a hand raised over there. Hello, Ellen. It is, uh, it is, thank you, Madam President, for, for being here. It's, a, it's been a very inspiring um, lecture. Um, Right now, in this uh, very conflicting times, people are talking about the nuclear arms race, but we're also seeing a big movement towards disarmament. Many people, many countries are coming together, and uh, there is hope in the hearts of many, including my own, that a nuclear weapons-free world is possible. And these efforts come at a time when women's participation in politics are stronger than ever. The Nuclear Ban Treaty Conference, for instance, was chaired by a woman, an Afro-Costa Rican ambassador. So my question to you is, do you think that world peace is possible? And do you think that peace has a woman's spirit? Thank you. Um, yes, I do think peace is possible. And I think that's why we are all working so hard towards settling the current conflict that's ongoing, working toward a return to a multilateral world. Yes, I think peace is possible. Uh, I think if Angela Merkel were there, we wouldn't be where we are today. <laughs> uh, 
uh, maybe she could have stopped this conflict. Um, when it comes to nuclear weapon, I, I'm, I'm part of the elders. The elders, a group of a former, you know, presidents headed by uh, Mary Robinson, mm -hmm. is the chair. Yeah. With Grasha Michelle, they are the two co-chairs, and Ban Ki Moon. Those are the three uh, leaders of the elders group of which I'm a part. And one of their effort has been, over the many years, was to to fight uh, in nuclear weapons and different treaties against this uh, weapon is something that they've been working on and continue to work on it. In Africa, the African Union have, have a, a protocol that, that is called silence the guns. And that is to stop guns in our societies. So yes, I believe peace is possible. Yes, I think if more women are given peacekeeping roles and are sitting at the dialogue for peace, you will achieve peace much faster and perhaps it will be more sustainable. Alguna pregunta más por aquí? Any more questions over here, I think? Yes, hello. I'm Son Solis. I'm a journalist. It is a pleasure to have heard you. My question as a Nobel Peace Prize awardee and also the first elected uh, female president in uh, Africa, in your biography you state that you are a grandmother. What, it, what phrases do you tell your grandchildren? What advice would you give them? Get an education <laughs> as much as you can. That's one thing nobody can take away from you. Even a gun cannot take the brain power. And so that's, that's number one. Get, him and get an education. Uh, become a professional. And then of course, you see yourself as a part of a human race. Uh, and so, do to others, as the Bible says, as you would expect them to do unto you. And so, grandchildren don't always listen. <laughs> 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 My duty and responsibility is to tell them and to keep telling them and hopefully that they will have the same values and, and principles that, that I adhere to. Teníamos una... Sí. Welcome to Spain. Thank you very much for being here. And after this romantic and uh, uh, pretty question, it's difficult for me to ask the following question. As a promoter of peace that you are, which clauses do you think uh, governments should include uh, so that wars are not recurrent? Because it seems that history is repeating itself. Right now it's Russia, it is Putin who is leading this terrible situation, but it is also said that in the near future it could be f the Far East. We could have another war there. How can we punish these murderers, these people who launch these kind of wars and civil population suffers the consequences. Which clause should the world establish governments to be able to um, punish people who start a war, to be able to consolidate peace, uh, anti-war clause and pro-peace. What could we do? Uh, what, what do you think we could do? Thank you very much. Well, I think that's an issue, you know, number one, the United Nations 
uh, has to deal with through the special institution and bodies established for that purpose. Uh, we have the International Criminal Code, uh, which deals with, with issues like that, and they have dealt with it. Um, I think different groupings, civil society groupings, media can continue to call for action. Um, leaders of international institutions that working on this have to be much more active, much more vigorous in the call for peace and in the call for being able to ensure that there are not only protection of those who are victimized, but that perpetrators will face legal action. But that's a matter for countries' laws and, and a matter for you know, international protocols and solidarity. Some of it is happening, but we all need to, to be a part of calling for more, more action, more laws, better laws implementation of existing laws. I, I think we all need to work on that. Thank you, Madam President, for giving us the opportunity of exchanging with you today. My question is about today, Africa, in the recent years, we have been hearing the interest of international actors and regional actors such as Russia or Turkey or China in order to penetrate in Africa, in the African countries. So I would like to know what's your opinion of them entering the African continent and if you think that the African Union can be capable of adopting a common line to share a strategy uh, between all the countries in the continent and not to let each individual uh, interests uh, lead the conversation. Africa is stronger today than it was several decades ago. The ability to formulate its own ambition, its own agenda, is much stronger today. Our African Union is much stronger today than it was. We we still have vestiges of the old partnerships. Our trading partnerships still remain countries under the influence of the United Kingdom, influence of the United States tend to. But all of that has changed. And Africa's own policy now is to be partners with everyone. And and as long as a certain amount of uh, respect for Africa's right to chart its own destiny, uh, as already emboldened in Africa 2063, um, as long as uh, people have a certain amount of respect for Africa's choice of its own priorities, um, I, I think the, the partnership is there. They, you, they, again, the geopolitical rivalry uh, that exists is something that we wish did not exist. We wish that partnerships would bring everybody together to be able to fight poverty wherever it exists in the South, whether it's Africa, whether it's Latin America, whether it's Asia, that you could see all the major powers, as they come together in the World Bank, in the International Monetary Fund, you know, in world, the uh, international trade, as they come together in those specified bodies toward addressing common issues of development and economic growth for all. I wish it's they would all come together 
only the United Nations, in those different resolutions that are made, that those resolutions would now move from just being an international uh, something to national policies and national laws. If that happened, then maybe we wouldn't find this continued geopolitical war for spheres of influence, you know. But no, that's the world we live in. <laughs> and we all have to see how different countries can ensure that they maintain their own geographic integrity um, and promote their own interests, but in the context of global unity and global cooperation. Okay, la última sin. Last question. I'm happy to to see you. And um, I'm a spiritual person. I'm a spiritual person. And uh, since the COVID-19 um, appeared, uh, I could feel uh, that the vibration of the Mother Earth is rising up. And I want to ask you uh, if you can feel the same. I mean, um, I know it's a weird uh, question, but um, the vibration of Mother Earth is rising up. That's what spiritual people can feel. You understand the question? Uh, the migration of Mother Earth. The Eye. vibration, the vibration of Mother Earth. I mean, the it's Earth rising is moving. up. What? The Earth is moving away? No, the vibration is like is something, love is expanding and um, the positive mind and... Oh. I mean, my experience with all what's happening is that um, the world is moving, is changing, and that good things are coming up. I mean, I'm, I'm positive on what's coming up. It's like uh, the power is changing, I think. People are more conscious about oh. nature. Okay. They uh, really know what really important is love and uh, share, and we are all together, all the planet is together with the same thing, yeah. so we I cooperate agree. with other countries, so north and south is not as far as it was before because of this. I understand. And this is positive, so I'm asking you about if you feel the same in that way, okay? I agree with you. Uh, those oligarchs are feeding away <laughs> people's power. <laughs> coming on stronger <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so in that respect I agree with you that uh, people as people are coming together more and more with the same objective of peace solidarity humanity you know so I will not name them but all those big powers there We think, we think they will fade away. <laughs> People's time has come. Okay, <laughs> President, certainly. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you so thank much you for your you. inspiration and sharing your experience. Come back soon. We need <laughs> to hear you. more from you. Muchas gracias. <laughs> yes, thank you very much.